11 o'clock. Um, <clears throat> don't forget, got some quizzes. Getting done. Uh, we'll still plan for our exam on Friday. We'll see where, how we go with this. All right, so uh, question came up on our life cycle quiz, part two. Um, final site of infection uh, for Clonorchis. Uh, yeah, so uh, I should have put it in, in the notes on the board. So one, the answer key was wrong. So I get like a batch of questions that I copy and paste because you can see if it's the same general types of questions. On that one, the, the, the answer wasn't updated. So I fixed that. Uh, I think it was counting it as lungs, but that wasn't correct. Uh, but on that, uh, the worm, you know, metastercaria exist, and then they travel in the gut up bile ducts where they mature. And then they typically stay there, but they could go further and bore into the liver. There's a possibility of that. So uh, on the board, or in my diagram here, I had uh, excessed in gut and then bile duct, and then I had an arrow that went to the liver. That liver part should have been in parentheses to say it's a possibility. That's one way in which you could get some pathology associated with it, that liver the bile duct is the side of is the final side of the infection. All right, so uh, so yeah, and that's you know if you have questions about that, I mean yeah, I'm making these fresh, so definitely a chance of, of uh, messing up the answer key. And believe it, uh, blackboard's just slow. Blackboard is slow when you do stuff. So we're on cestodes, all right? This is where we left off. We were talking about uh, strobola. What was the strobola? That was the main part of the body. It's where all of our proglottids are. And the proglottids is technically the area around all of the genitalia, all right? Genitalium is that the set of the reproductive organs, all right? Uh, most of the tapeworms that you've seen and you've probably heard, read about or heard about are all polyzoic, meaning we've got multiple proglottids in them, uh, but we do have some that are monozoic, meaning that it, it consists of basically a single genitalium, and it's not even necessarily a proglottid. This is one. Uh, it's a that's in uh, the caryophyllidae, the caryophyllidia. Uh, but you can see this is a tapeworm. It almost looks like it, it's a digenetic trematode but it doesn't have the oral sucker, doesn't have any of the ventral suckers or acetabula. Uh, but this is a tapeworm, it's got a Bothria scolex. So it, it's a tapeworm, and, and we'll talk about uh, this order. Now, <clears throat> and I think we left off with the constrictions. So what gives it the appearance of this segmentation was constrictions that happen. But the constrictions don't actually separate each of the individual proglottids. There is no separation. There's no membrane there. Everything is, conti is contiguous until you get to that final terminal proglottids where you do start seeing membrane, uh, membranes form between them uh, because that could be a way in which eggs get released. Meaning you could have detachment of our proglottids that then travel down the gut and leave the host or they rupture inside the intestine leaving, leaving our uh, eggs did to get passed in the feces. And there's terms for that. I thought it was on this slide, it's on the next slide. All right, so uh, inside the strobola, maturity extends posteriorly. So the youngest proglottids are the closest to the scolex, the most mature, the oldest proglottids are located uh, at the very posterior end of the, of the strobola. Uh, maturation is typically male first and then female. Typically, male genitalia, male gonads develop first, and then females develop second. Uh, you can have mating within a proglottid. Uh, Echinococcus will do that, and I might have a, a diagram of how that works. Uh, you can have mating between proglottids. I mean, if you have a worm that's a foot long, you can see the, the worm can fold in and on itself, and you have uh, sexual reproduction that way, or you can have reproduction between two different worms. 
so uh, different ways in which you could have sexual reproduction. After you have the mating, then you have egg development, and what will happen is you, as you start getting the eggs maturing or being developed and being stored in the uterus, you have typically see degeneration of the genitalia until you get a proglottid that's basically filled with eggs. And that's a term that's called gravid. So a proglottid that is gravid is a proglottid that is completely full of eggs. Now, it's fully developed eggs or shelled embryos. It doesn't necessarily mean we have a fully developed oncosphere inside of it. It just means we have a fully developed egg. Those are ready to be released. Now, some of our uh, proglottids, uh, and we'll see some of them, uh, it's, has this feature called craspidote. Uh, and what that means is that our posterior edge of the proglottid overlaps with the anterior edge of the other one. So if we had proglottids, all right, it's depicted where we don't have any sort of overlap. But occasionally what you'll have is what looks like a narrowing and an overlap. And we have some slides where you can actually see that. That term is called craspidote. It is uh, a diagnostic feature, it helps us identify worms. Uh, if we have margins that don't overlap, then it's acraspidote. So uh, again, we have some slides of, of both ways. I didn't put these terms on the word list, uh, but you can kind of pencil them in. I won't ask them on our practical. Craspidote and acraspidote. Alright. Alright, so how does the eggs get out? Well, in almost all cases, they're going to get passed with the feces, but that's not really the focus here uh, because we have tapeworms and tapeworms have proglottids. So sometimes proglottids themselves become gravid, they become packed with eggs, and then they detach from the strobola and travel down the intestine. That type of a release is apolysis, what we call it. It detaches. Now, the gravid proglottid can pass from the host, and that's how it gets out. Or the proglottid could actually rupture as it's on its way out, and then the eggs are, are what gets released in the feces. So kind of a complicating feature in our life, life cycles. And I'll, I'll label what's going on uh, in these life cycles. We do have a worm that exhibits this type, which is an apolysis. So I'm gonna, I use apolysis and an apolysis. Uh, it could also mean pseudapolysis. But what this is, instead of having proglottids detach, you have the eggs being released through the uterine pore. So the eggs are released basically one at a time. It could be rapid succession, but the eggs are released. And then once the proglottid is, has emptied itself of the eggs, then the proglottid detaches because it's not going to just hang out and stay. We've already degenerated our genitalia, all right? And that basically we've exhausted for the proglottid. It'll just detach and then, then break up. Some cases, it'll actually happen through a tear in the tegument. And then once it, once it empties its eggs, then that, that last segment will get released. Final way is something called hyperapolysis. So it has apolysis in its terms, so the proglottid detaches. But in this situation, we have immature proglottids that are going to detach. So proglottids that have basically mated, but they haven't started producing eggs. So then what happens is this proglottid detaches, still absorbs nutrients from the host, but it continues its development producing these eggs. So it almost becomes an independent unit, separate from the, ho from the, from the worm, from the parent worm. Uh, there are some, I do have one slide of a parasite that, that does this. Right, it's, it came from a personal, personal collection, but I thought, for completeness, I'd include, include this hyperapolysis. And we're not going to talk about that group 
uh, we just won't have time. That'll get cut. So those are egg releases. And for our life cycle, I will write down apolysis or anapolysis. Uh, fortunately, I think we only have one species that is anapolysis. Everything else is apolysis. All right, tegument. We're in the platyhelminthes, so we have a syncytial tegument. Structure is basically the same. Your, your interdental spaces, uh, your cytons, you know, function and everything, but our cestodes have an extra feature called microtrichs or microthrichs. It's these guys, these finger like projections. These finger like pro projections. And they don't, they can be simple, like right over here, where they do look like villi, you know, microvilli or whatever. Or they can be somewhat complex, it looks like this. This can also be a diagnostic feature. So kind of zooming in and looking at what, what the micro tricks look like. And you could, you could wonder, okay, why do these guys have them, but like our trematodes do not? Well, you have to think about their function. What are we doing? We're drastically increasing the surface area. Why do we want to do that? Well, if we increase our surface area, we increase absorption. Cestodes lack a mouth. They lack digestive system. So the only way in which these guys can acquire nutrients is through absorption. So this is one of those adaptations that kind of goes hand in hand. You're going to live by absorbing all your nutrients. You better have a lot of surface area. Microtreaks can do this. Everything else in our syncytial segment, everything we've talked about, protection, function, or the function of it and everything, it all applies. It's just these guys have microtreaks. Pretty much everything else is going to be very similar to all the other body helminthes that we've talked about. So our excretory system, our osmoregulatory system mm -hmm. is proto-nephridial in nature. All right, you've got your flame cells and it leads to collecting ducts. What a uh, nice thing is in this group is that you can typically see the collecting ducts in the proglottids. And you can see this. Uh, if you've looked at the word list, you'll see that I have, I believe I have uh, the excretory ducts on a couple of our specimens. Mm -hmm. Now, we have longitudinal collecting ducts that run the length of the worm, and you can see that they go between proglottids. Well, we already said, these aren't like individual segments. Right? It's, it's continuous uh, between these segments. It's just the constrictions give the appearance of this segmentation. Uh, so we've got lateral, collecting ducts, and usually they exist in pairs, where you have a, a dorsal uh, and a ventral duct on each side of our, uh, of our worm. And then you typically have transverse ducts that connect the two sides, and those are only on our ventral canal. So I think we do have one where you can identify the transverse canal. Not on every specimen, because these are older slides and the stay, it started to de-stain a bit, uh, but you might be able to see these. Our collect the collecting ducts do merge in the school legs area. They don't have uh, they don't have like an excretory pore, excretory, excretory bladders. Nervous system, bladder type system, just like we've seen. Uh, most of our worms, we have paired cerebral ganglia. So you've got two of them. And they're in the scolex region, and then you have two nerve cords that run down the length of that strobola. 
The one exception is Dihilobothrum, which is a species that we have in the lab, which is a species we'll talk about. That has a single ganglion, which kind of begs the question, why? Why is it just one? Why not two? Uh, it's probably a secondary loss. Just based on systematics. But, you know, just add that exception. So don't say, oh, tapeworms always have two cerebral ganglia. Not all of them. We have an exception. We do have transverse commissures to those ladders, the, the, I guess the rung of the ladder uh, on our diagram. Uh, they're found in every proglottid. So it's a sensory. And then branching off these nerve cords, we have various sensory apparatus, both chemical and tactile. Reproductive system, highly variable, highly variable in structure, arrangement, and distribution among all the various taxonomic groups. Uh, we're not going to really discuss them here. Uh, we'll point out some of the differences as, as we introduce the families, uh, and you'll see some of these differences in the sides. That, that's one of those things that will help you identify the proglottids, know what, what group they belong to. And the reason we're not going to spend a whole lot of time now is because the systems are similar to the rest of the platyhelminthes. Right? So your ootype, your ovary, your malus gland, all of that stuff, terminology still stays the same. It still follows the same general pattern. All right? But with our cestodes, we do exhibit this proteandry, which is, I knew the term was coming up, uh, male organs develop first. They develop first before the female organs, and it's thought that this might actually be a way to avoid self-fertilization, at least within the same proglottid. Not necessarily between the worms, because the worms can fold in upon themselves, but perhaps within the same proglottid. Well, point out some of the structures in our diversity slides. Ready? Almost. So we're getting to the life cycle variation. We're getting close to finished on this one. Cesto life cycles generally follow one of two major patterns. Uh, I used to say it was kind of aquatic versus terrestrial, and for the most part, that's true. You've got an aquatic type, type of pattern and then a terrestrial type of pattern. And I've got my names here, and we're going to kind of define some of the terms in this presentation and define others when we get to those example life cycles. All right? So, uh, in both of these, our life cycle generally relies on trophic connections between their hosts. So we really, the cestodes, hugely dependent on predator-prey interactions or herbivore-plant interactions. Consumption is a major way in which we get infected. So in our aquatic type of life cycle, what you typically have is go from your egg to the oncosphere, to a procircoid, to a plerocircoid, and then to an adult. All right, so like two different developmental stages in our larval stage. Also in this aquatic life cycle, I put this in parentheses. This is where we would see a coracidium if it's in that life if it's in that life cycle. So a coracidium is going to be equivalent to our mirosidium or oncomerosidium. It's going to be our ciliated stage. It doesn't do you a whole lot of good to be be a ciliated stage on land. All right, so this would be kind of be the, the aquatic type of life cycle. 
Chorosidiums uh, only appear in those. Terrestrial type of life cycles, you have your egg, you have your oncosphere, and then you have a cystocercoid or a cystocircus type of larval stage. All right, and there's several of these. All right, these are not necessarily, some of them could be, would qualify as bladder worms. So you've got like a solid type of larval stage in the procercoid, pleurocercoid, and then these, you might have the appearance of some sort of bladder uh, inside of that worm, and then you get to your adult. Uh, now, these are the basic patterns, but again, you're going to have a lot of variation. And that, a lot of that variation kind of comes down to what that metacestode is. And just a generic term for a metacestode is a larval stage. The larval stage be before the adult. So it's kind of between that oncosphere and the adult stage. What is the metacestode like? What does it do? And that's where we're going to see a lot of this stuff. All right, so this is just kind of this diagram. I think this is our textbook. Just shows you all all of that, the ways in which you you can you can go the different life cycle stages. So we've just drastically increased the number of larval stage names, just by going from Digenea to Cestodes. So there is a common larval stage, and that is the Oncosphere also called the hexacanth larva. All right, so I think hexacanth kind of gives, gives you a clue to its name. Hexacanth, right? Six hooks. That's what an oncosphere possesses. It's a non-ciliated larval stage, possesses six hooks. Hooks are likely used in penetration. All right, so it's not ciliated and it has hooks. Now, these guys could retain in the inner envelope of the egg. So the inner envelope of the egg. And that could be ciliated. And that's what is the, the coracidium. So the coracidium is an oncosphere larvae that has retained its ciliated inner envelope. And that allows it to swim around. But all of our life cycles have this oncosphere. That's what's going to be inside of our egg. And again, I've got these on the handouts. So the handouts, I think, I think I posted the last one for the Sesto, Sesto diversity. I think they're all there. So if you print out those, those pages, you can kind of have them, and you can add notes to those pages and use them in the lab. All right, so the Metacesto, as I said, that's a stage between the oncosphere and the adult. And that's where we see a lot of our variation. This is the variation right here in, in these diagrams. So you have these solid type larval stages or you have a bladder type larval stage. And the bladder type stage is what we would say is cystocircus type. All right, so of our solid type larval stages, we have our procercoids and the pleurocercoids, but it also includes the cystocercoids and the pleurocircus larval type. So if you just kind of went over here, you've got your uh, pleurocercoids and pleurocercoids. You can see these are solid type of larval stages. And then you also have your pleural surface, pleural surface and cystocircoid. So this kind of looks like it's a bladder, and, and that's what it's saying. It could have a bladder, it might not have a bladder um, for that pleural surface type, but it, it's typically described as being a solid type of larval stage. And that's different from these other ones, the cystocircus, sinurus, uh, hydatids, and strobilus circus, which are these. All right. Because you've got basically the scolex is invaginated inside a bladder. 
So you can notice that. You can see Skolex types on here. Definitely, these are uh, proteocephalins. Uh, you can see your acetabular, your Skolex, your uh, Bactria on that. It's external. All of these guys, we have evaginated Skolex. Well, I guess Drobus is a little bit different. But here, evaginated Skolex. Most of these, most of the bladder type, can exhibit budding can exhibit asexual reproduction. So you get one, that intermediate host that say consumes an egg, gets infected, that egg can give rise to thousands of these larval stages inside that one host. Has the potential to cause some significant pathology. All right, you get this? So, that's our introduction to the cestodes. Let's move on to our diversity. And so we kind of gave you background. Now let's talk about more of the specifics. And what we're going to do is hit all the ones that, of the slides that we have in the lab. Some exception. At least one exception. So. We're going to start. We have various orders in the cestodes. And for us, we're basically only going to talk about two orders. Order of Pseudophilidia is this one. And then we're also going to talk about order of Cyclophilidia. So for us, we basically have a single Cyclophilidian order or specimen uh, that we look at. And then all the rest belong to the Cyclophilidians. So that kind of helps, helps it a little bit easy, easier to keep track of. Now, in this order, we have two longitudinal Bothria. So that's our typical Skolex, uh, is a Bothria. And then in this order, we actually have three genital pores. You're going to have a uterine pore opening, you're going to have an opening for a vagina, and then you're going to have the opening for the male system, so where the serous comes out. The three genital pores. And our specimen in the lab, Diphilobothrium, it's, you can identify all three. In this group, the vitellaria are always follicular and they are scattered. So just like what we've seen in, in the digenea, it's, you've got same type of description of, of our vitellin glands, right? They're follicular, kind of on a, what I would call like a tree-like structure with, it, with our uh, flower buds as, a, as the uh, vitellin gland. Uh, and they're going to be on the periphery, so more towards the outer part of the proglottid. The interior part of the proglottid is where you're going to find the testes. And normally, right, these testes are also going to be what you could describe as being follicular, all right? at least in how we, we approach it. But it's, it's not. You have all, you've got numerous, numerous testes, so we can... There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. You see it, you see it. So from each testes, you have a vas efferens that joins up to vas deferens, con common vas deferens going to a single one ultimately. So you've got numerous vitellaria, uh, vitellin glands, you've got numerous testes in this order. Typical life cycle is aquatic, normally. So first intermediate hosts on these aquatic life cycles tend to be a crustacean of some sort. And then the second intermediate host tends to be a fish. And we'll talk about like specifics. This order also contains the largest of our tapeworms. So the largest one is Hexagonophorus by Ceteris. More than 30 meters long, up to 45,000 45, proglottids. Each of our proglottids have anywhere from 4 to 14 complete sets of genitalia. That's a huge reproductive output. And if you think about why, why, just why, well, think of the host, sperm whale. How likely are you to go out into the ocean and find a sperm whale? Not very likely at all. How likely is it 
for an egg, one of these guys, to find its intermediate host if it comes out of this sperm whale. Extremely unlikely. But we can bring that, that probability up to actually being likely if we increase our egg output, and this is one of the ways in which we do it. So we don't not only have this really long, uh, really long worm with thousands upon thousands of proglottids, but each proglottid ends up almost becoming subdivided to have its own reproductive set or set of reproductive structures. All right. So note our bilobed ovary. Yeah, you're going to see that in one of our slides. But it has everything else. Everything else we have: Sears, Sears pouch, the Sears Sears pouch. Uh, you've got your uh, vagina, the ovary. A seminal receptacle, we really can't see that uh, in our slides, but you've got your ovary, it tends to be bilobed, you have your oocytes, your vitiligen glands, all of that stuff that, that we've learned in the trematodes, it's there. Now, this order has two families that we're going to talk about. First family is the Karyophyllidia. All right, we talk about this because this is our one, this is our example of a monozoic tapeworm. If you look at this, you wouldn't have thought of it being a tapeworm because it doesn't have the proglottids. But, in fact, it is a cestode. And even systematic supports the case that it is a cestode. All right? So members of this family are usually found in the intestine of freshwater fish, freshwater teleos fish. Primarily, you're going to find them in cyprinids, catfishes, and catastomids, which are our suckers, typically where you're going to find them. So freshwater fish. Scolex is Bothria. That, that qualifies the weakly muscular roofs. It's monozoic, so we only have one genitalium in the entire worm. And there's no evidence of segmentation. The internal anatomy, so even though we don't have all these different proglottids, in that genitalium, the anatomy is similar to, to other pseudophilidians. So bilobed ovary, uh, your scattered vitellaria, your scattered testes, uh, and that's kind of how I have this diagram. We don't have a specimen like this. Uh, I wish we did, but, but we don't. Uh, but this is what our example life cycle, our worm of the example life cycle will look like. All right. Karyophyllus laticeps. It's called the clover worm because of our scolex. So you think, you know, Bothria scolex, I do like these sucking grooves. Well, this one has weakly suck sucking grooves up at the top, and it gives the image that it has a clover, clover-shaped, hence its name. All right. So, did I leave that marker there? I must have left the marker. Let's go through our life cycle. I know suckers aren't a popular fish among anglers. It'd be great if someone would bring some in and so we can look through them. Project, possibly. All right, let me go to the blue. Okay. I mean, I don't, it's, this isn't my blue marker. Do you see a blue marker around? I got the same, like the generic universal brand. But we'll, we'll try this one. This one, let's hope this is better. All right, so, uh, here you'll feel this. Let me start. Monozoic tape. So our host is a fish, as we said, our definitive host. Our adults are going to be in the intestine. And this will be our one life cycle. We don't really have a term like anapolysis or apolysis because you don't really have the possibility of detachment. So just in quotation marks, 
up with this anaphylysis because we're releasing the eggs through the uterine. So, in the feces, out comes the egg. Right. Our egg is going to remain infected for at least three months, where it's going to sit out in the environment and wait to be consumed by the intermediate host. And our host is an oligarchy. Tubifis, tubificid, oligarchy. So it consumes the egg. The onchosphere hatches from the egg, where it is in the gut. It then bur bores itself out into the hemocyte where it develops into a pro-circoid. Into a pro-circoid. And then, once it gets to our pro-circoid stage, it is now infective to our fish host. Pretty simple life cycle. However, there's some things to go around with this. So, in our life cycle, this whole development to our pro circoid can, can happen fairly quickly. So, in a year, you've got egg release, the ligachy gets, you know, picks up. The egg, you have pro circoid that develops, and then the fish can eat it, let's say in August, September. All right. Does our parasite start developing eggs at that time? No, it doesn't. What's going to happen is our pro circoid will just kind of start developing, will mature, but not start, it doesn't start producing eggs. Egg production is actually stimulated by the reproductive hormones in our host. So in the fall, these fish aren't mating. You don't have reproductive hormones act acting there, so you don't have that sort of stimulation. Now, once they do start producing these reproductive hormones and they're getting ready to spawn, now you start having reproduction maturation, or finished, I should say, egg production, in our parasite, releasing the egg, all right? Now, egg release, is only for about two months. Because our parasite typically lives no more than a year. And that is from egg to adult. So, it waits for the spring, gets a signal, starts producing the eggs, and then the eggs have about three months in which they, can, they need to get to that oligarchy worm. And you might be wondering, what happens if the oligarchy doesn't get eaten in that fall? Because the oligarchy can survive. The oligarchy lives about a year. About one year. But most importantly is, in this life cycle where they live a year, we have cohort turnover in June and July. So, any of those worms, those oligochetes that picked up the infection in the spring, they die off in June and July. They're in the old cohort. 
So then you have all of those individuals that were infected, they get lost. You have a new generation coming in. Well, you've got your fish that have spawned. You've got two months where the eggs are being released. And then you have another three months that those eggs remain out there to infect our new cohort of oligochetes. Now, in that new cohort of oligochetes, they get considered, they ingest that egg. You have development to the proserpoid, but what happens if they never get consumed by a fish? Well, then you have this extra thing. This is parentheses. You have a nearly mature proserpoid that develops. And it develops slowly over winter. You have a nearly mature pro, pro circoid. So you start having development of the reproductive structures in this pro circoid itself, which would typically tell you, hey, well, we've transitioned. We're no longer a pro circoid. However, those are pro circoids because they possess this structure there. That structure right here is called the circle mirror. And that is the defining feature of a procircoid. So a procircoid is our larval stage, a metacestode. It possesses a posterior circle mirror. And that circle mirror is a posterior knob-like appendage that contains the larval hooks. So we find it on procircoids. We also find it on cystocircoids. So we have some cystocircoids of Hymenolopus in the lab. You can take a look at it. You can actually see that appendage. Now here, it's pretty not. It's pretty small. It could be a little bit longer. It could be more short and, and knob-like. All right, but we have this posterior appendage. The larval hooks were retained on that appendage. So in our life cycle, we get to our procircoid, and then as they overwinter. Those procircoids are developing mature gonads. But they wait until they get the reproductive hormones in that next host where they drop your circomere or they absorb the circomere, uh, you know, and then start completely transitioning to the adult and, and reproduce. So it's a very timed life cycle. It's a very timed life cycle because you've got the intermediate host that's only living a year and you have complete cohort turnover that happens in the summer every year. So you can have infections early on. Yeah, a lot of those eggs get lost because the oligochetes die off, but if the oligochetes gets consumed by a fish early on, all right, it's in that host, and typically those, those newer fish will reproduce the next year. Pretty cool? I think so. Any questions? All right, next family is Diphilobothriidae. These are our broad fish tapeworms. Why are they called that? They're relatively wide. 13 distinct species in the, di uh, in the genus Diphilobothrium. All of them can infect humans. There's two of them that are probably the most common in humans, uh, Diphilobothrium dendriticum and Diphilobothrium latum. Now, some people would have, would have said that these are one species, but uh, sequence analysis and developmental analysis suggests otherwise. So dendriticum is, in, is throughout the northern hemisphere globally. Diphilobothrium latum is typically restricted to Scandinavian countries, the Baltics, Western Russia, and, and so forth. And, but it's also been then introduced to other areas, including around the Great Lakes and along the West Coast. Not just in the wild animals, but in humans. So 9 million people are infected worldwide with Diphilobothrium. All 
our hosts are basically the same for our two species, Dendriticum and Leo. So, we're not really going to distinguish between the two uh, when it comes to the life cycle. So, in our diphilobothrium, I might be able to get this drawn in five minutes. I might not be able to put everything up there. All right, so our final host is a fish eating mammal. A fish eating mammal. Something's going to have to eat that fish. Eat a raw fish. Or severely uh, undercooked fish. All right. This is anapolysis. So eggs get shed through the uterine pore. They go out in the feces where they enter the water. And then they hatch, releasing the coracidium. Coracidium is going to get consumed by our, our first intermediate host, which is a copepod. And I'm, I'm not putting up our, our adaptations of this stuff. I think we're going to have to do that on Monday. So you've got your onchosphere that basically sheds that inner envelope, shedding out your cilia. So you have your onchosphere, that's in our gut. It's going to bore out of the gut and develop into a procercoid where it is found in the hemocele, so the body cavity of our copepod. Once we get to our procercoid then, we can get consumed by our fish host. And many different types of fish can serve as a host uh, for diphilobothrium. All right, so inside our fish, we have our procercoid, which is now in the gut. The procercoid will burrow out into muscle, various tissues, basically, and develop into a pleurocercoid. I'm going to put various tissues. Usually in the fish, it's going to be in the muscle tissue. All right. Usually it's going to be in the muscle tissue, but it can go, it can basically go anywhere. And muscle, fat tissue could go uh, to uh, different pathology or different, uh, maybe the kidneys, the gonads. All right. Uh, it's a source of pathology for our fish. Now with our fish then, it, once it gets to the pleural circoid stage, it is now infective, so our fish can be consumed by our fish eating mammal. And then, once we get in there, you have maturation to our adult. Where it is found in the small intestine. Not just any part of the small intestine is actually located in the anterior third of the small intestine. Our trigger for development is an increase in temperature. So we go from cold-blooded, which is incorrect, but poikilotherms to a homeotherm, all right, which is increase in temperature inside the gut. And that's how our worm knows that it's in a, in a vertebrate. There is one thing, though. So what size fish is eating a copepod? Small fish, pretty small fish, right? Fish eating mammal could include, you know, bears, grizzly bears. What size fish are those eating? Much bigger one. So yeah, in our life cycle, we have many peritonic hosts. Specifically, many other fish hosts. Where if a fish consumes one of these infected fish with a pleurocircoid, the pleurocircoid migrates out of the gut to various tissue. And 
it could be, you know, a loop type thing, you know, kind of building it up from small fish to slightly larger fish to slightly larger fish until we get to that spot. So this ability to utilize a peritonic host, you know, is one of those adaptations to increase transmission. Your fish eating mammal isn't really eating the fish that feeds on the first intermediate host. So this kind of gives it away, the parasite away, to get up to that fish eating mammal. And what we see is accumulation in these peritonic hosts. So you may have these guys that have only one or two pleurocircoids, but then in these peritonic hosts, they start having tens to hundreds of these pleurocircoids. Kind of biomagnification. All right, what we'll do is uh, on Monday, we'll, we'll get this life cycle back up. Um, if I remember to get here early, I'll actually get it drawn early, and we'll talk about the adaptations uh, that increase transmission success. Uh, and then also we'll talk about pathology. Because humans can get infected, we're fish eating mammals. Right? Some of us are. But if you cook your fish, you're safe. All right, have a good one.